Amen. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Bill McKeever. Uh, glad that you could all be here today. I had the pleasure of meeting Sandra and for a very short time, it was Gerald that day. It was in 1977, August of 1977. I can't forget that because that was the what 100th anniversary of Brigham Young's death. Okay, that's that's how well, I. I didn't they, that. Yeah, <laughs> but they made a big deal out of, uh, on it on television when I was up here. My wife and I were on vacation. Uh, I've got a great woman who goes to some of the places that I go to. Um, but I had the pleasure of meeting Sandra, had a good conversation with her there. We knew each other, of course, by letter. We didn't have email back then. Uh, but I remember Gerald poking out, saying hi for a little while, shy guy, and then he kind of went back. And uh, But it started a, a very good friendship, especially when I moved here in the year 2004 and had the honor of being able to volunteer at the Utah Lighthouse Bookstore. And then when Eric moved up in 2010, we kind of traded off on Saturdays to hopefully give Sandra a little bit of a break. Uh, but we were kind of sad when she announced her retirement, but I figure I'm not going into my 80s. I, I'm not planning on doing that. Uh, so she has a very good run and still going, and we want to talk a little bit about what she's doing now. But uh, Ron comes on the scene and is going to put together a biography of both Sandra and Gerald. And, of course, the name of the book is Lighthouse. And we're going to talk to Ron a little bit about that as well. A little informal conversation. And uh, so hopefully I, I, we're going to get a little personal occasionally. Uh, but I want them to kind of go back and forth. Feel free to just... Take it and run if you want to. Don't worry about my questions. I'm just throwing these in to get as a conversation starter. But basically, Sandra, we're going to start off as how did you and Gerald meet? <laughs> well, now there's a story. Uh, well, I don't know where to start on that one. As a precursor to this, my mom had started to question Mormonism when I was a young teen. And so through high school, she was trying to tell me there were problem areas and I was telling her I had a testimony. And um, I didn't know that my mom and my aunt and my grandma had been doing far more serious research on Mormon problems than I had realized. And they had read Von Brody's book, No Man Knows My History. That had, From there, they wanted to check out all the sources to make sure she was telling things straight. So uh, that's the background for the next chapter of my life. Um, I had a boyfriend at BYU. And uh, I'm down in Southern California in the San Fernando Valley area. And my boyfriend's up at BYU. And... I'm thinking he's probably looking at girls, so I decide uh, on spring break I ought to come up and um, make sure he remembers what I look like. <laughs> and so my grandma had been down for the winter in California visiting different kids. I mean, she had nine kids, so she could travel forever and just have someone to stay with. And she did. I mean, she had ec extra pair of garments in her purse all the time mm -hmm. so that anyone going anywhere she could hop in and go because she had a toothbrush toothpaste and an extra set of garments that she was good you know <laughs> anyway she was a real character so uh my grandma decided to come back to salt lake and wanted someone to go with her to help her with her luggage I, we're going back on the bus so i thought well this is a great idea to remind that guy at byu what i look like so I write him and tell him, you know, I'm coming to Salt Lake. Uh, do you want to come up to my grandma's for that weekend? So he says, yeah. So anyways, we come up here. And my boyfriend comes over to my grandma's. And uh, uh, we, the first day, we had a real nice visit and all. And he stayed in my grandma's front room. And then the second day, by the way, <laughs> he, he wants to play the field. And I, you know. I knew that was, I suspected that was coming. So anyways, I'm all in remorse on Sunday with him going back to BYU and uh, uh, that path in my life that I thought was going one way uh, was cut off. So 
I'm, that's not the guy I'm going to end up getting married to. So Sunday evening, my grandma asked me if I would drive her to a meeting. We were using my uncle's car. And um, I said, well, what kind of meeting is it, grandma? And she said, well, it's sort of like a Mormon fireside. <laughs> now, if you knew my grandma, you'd know that's a red flag. Because <laughs> when, when anything sort of, it isn't. <laughs> and she was very cagey about things. I mean, if she had an agenda, if she acted cagey, you knew there was, she's going to ask you to do or go or something that you wouldn't normally say yes to. So she's hedging. And I said, well, what kind of meeting is it, Grandma? Oh, it's like, you know, fireside, and someone's going to talk. Yeah, yeah, but what kind of meeting? Well, I didn't want to go because I thought it was going to be a bunch of 80-year-olds like me, you know, now. <laughs> and I like this room. And, uh, <laughs> And at 18, who wants to spend Sunday evening with a bunch of old people after your boyfriend's just uh, told you we're done, you know? <laughs> uh, so, but she put me on a guilt trip. So I drive her over to the west side of Salt Lake and I go up and knock on the door. And this tall, nice looking young man answers the door and his name was Gerald Tanner. <laughs> so God delivered me to Gerald's front door from Southern California to Salt Lake. And uh, he had come out of most of Mormonism through other uh, associations he had, and that's in the book. Um, and he was having this little cottage meeting to <coughs> tell people about his research that he had found problems in early Mormonism. He had found a little splinter group of Mormonism that believed just the Bible and Book of Mormon and uh, didn't believe any of the rest of Mormonism. None of the other revelations after the Book of Mormon was printed. And uh, so he's talking about these things. Well, th if things he brought up were things my mom had challenged me with. So it wasn't a shock to hear critical things of Mormonism being discussed. And he was real cute. <laughs> <laughs> and so after the meeting, I went up to him and I said, oh, that was so interesting. Why don't, <laughs> why don't you come over to my grandma's house and tell me more? <laughs> and uh, Gerald it was all sincerity and didn't realize I was setting a trap. But uh, anyways, so that's how it all began. Well, tell about the first meeting, the oh. dishes. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it happened to be April Fool's Day. And I don't know I, what got into me, but um, I decided to pull a prank on Gerald. That's the first time he's coming over, you know. I mean, I just barely have met him a couple days before. And so I thought, I'm going to set the, he was coming for dinner. I'm going to set the table with all kind of stuff that you normally wouldn't eat from the kitchen, but you wouldn't use to eat from. You know, so uh, measuring cup for a glass and a pie tin and, you know, odd utensils to the side of the pie tin and that. And so, I mean, every, it was all kitchen stuff, but it wasn't for the right purpose uh, that it set <laughs> out. Oh, so Gerald comes in and he sits down and he looks at the table and he, oh, he was so sweet. He's trying so hard to keep his composure because he doesn't want to offend me. And um, it's always it, looking around, he doesn't say hardly anything about it. You know, and I just tried to do some small talk while he's, because I'm waiting for him to get the joke, you know, for him to say, oh yeah, funny April Fool's joke. He doesn't. <laughs> and so finally I says, April Fools! And he's like, what? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so it's a wonder he even talked to me again because I totally humiliated him. <laughs> ah, there you are. So but obviously it worked. <laughs> how, how long was the courting with, with you and Gerald? Um, well, we met a few days before April 1st, and we got married June 14th. Wow. That's pretty quick. Yes. Okay, all you moms out there, <laughs> think about this. 
your daughter goes to Salt Lake to see her boyfriend and accompany your mother back home and then calls you up a week later and says, by the way, mom, I'm not coming back to college. I'm going to stay up here with grandma. And by the way, I've met a guy and we're studying Mormon history together. Next phone call. Hi, mom. Gerald and I are engaged and <laughs> I'm leaving the church. <laughs> You have a problem with this. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, my mom caught the next plane <laughs> to Salt Lake. <laughs> oh, and then Gerald and I almost eloped. Is that in the book? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's all in the book. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I, I've got a question because I, I don't remember because it's been a while since I, I read the book. I read the manuscript. Uh, there's a question about the honeymoon. Um, some kind of. Well, I have a lot of questions about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. About One of my prompt first questions night, here is. First night. Uh, where oh, first night. Okay. <laughs> yeah, normally you you want to know? Talk about our honeymoon, so this yes. ought to be good. Uh, yes. So. Uh, my mom had been flipping a house in, in the town nearby, and so it was standing vacant. And so she says, so the plan was that after we got married that we would go stay in this house she was getting ready to resell. And then we'd go on our honeymoon up to Yellowstone, not Yellowstone, Yosemite. And okay, so uh, Gerald goes in the bathroom first and uh, comes back out, he's ready for bed. And uh, then I went in the bathroom to get ready. I come back out, and I hop right into bed. And then I realize he had, didn't get in bed. And I he's kneeling to the side of the bed praying. And I felt like such a heathen. <laughs> uh, really, you know, uh, why didn't you even mention that you wanted to pray? You know, it just, ah. Uh, anyways. It, that, so one of the problems we had in our marriage was communication. <laughs> <laughs> so Ron, how did you meet Sandra and how did that? Well, I met Sandra coming back from my doctorate. I knew of Sandra because I'd read her stuff starting in the 80s, her and Gerald's stuff. And one of the things that really intrigued me about it was that there's all these books about Mormonism. Now, part of my, my own history involves uh, staying with the Mormon family that were very wild and wooly, um, visionary, uh, didn't keep the, the word of wisdom. But, uh, you know, the father had seen John the Baptist in snowstorm and, you know, the <laughs> daughter had visions and all these stories. And so when I started, when I became a Christian and I'm reading Christian books about Mormonism, I just, you know, this stuff is not that good. Some of this stuff is not that accurate, you know. And, uh, and, but there was these funny, funny newsletters that, or books that were sort of these off-size things with the funny colors and, and I, craft. <laughs> right, and so I started reading those things and realizing these guys are good. You know, I mean, they really do their research and they do them on subjects that Mormons know and care about, you know, yeah. and, and, um, <clears throat> And so I, you know, it was that contradiction. So what happened was we, when we were coming back from my, our doctorate with our, we had four kids, we stopped through Salt Lake City and they, we knew that the Tanners were on uh, uh, South Temple. So we figured, you know, who is this uh, couple that's shaking the whole church, you know? And um, what year are we talking about? We're talking about 1996, 1995 and 1996. Really, that late? That late. Okay. Well, we commu we communicated by mail before that. Okay. And um, <clears throat> uh, so, and phone actually too uh, on different research questions. And so we well, let's find these this place where these tanners are, you know. And we drive and drive, you know, down South Temple. Well, where is it? You know, it gets kind of more less good neighborhoods, <laughs> and finally. We find it there, and uh, it's this little tiny house, you know. <clears throat> we go in there, and Sandra's sitting there pleasantly, and we're th and uh, and uh, we're thinking, this is this is the woman that is 
bringing down the church. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and uh, our daughters were very enthusiastic, and Sandra gave them some evangelistic tracts, and we bought William Morgan's um, uh, book on uh, oh, her problem. Where's your, your thing on? All right, here, let's put this back on somehow. On Freemasonry, because that was, uh, that's another story. Yeah. But uh, that, so that's how we actually met the first time. And then uh, we moved down here in uh, 2000, uh, 1999, 2000 to teach at the seminary here. And of course, then first, one of the first people we wanted to see again was the Tanners. And so we've known Sandra since, you know, on a regular basis, Sandra and Gerald since uh, about 2000. But you have no background in the LDS church? Uh, except for uh, this very close, uh, almost like a second family, where, which I lived with for, from time to time as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Sandra, I'm always intrigued by the uh, subjects that face Latter-day Saints that caused them to start studying their way out. With you, what was that? Um, well, the first vision was uh, an area that my mom had been troubled by, reading Brody's book. Now, remember, this is before a lot of discoveries had been made. Uh, at this point, no one knows about the 1832 account of the first vision, if you know enough about first vision story. but. Uh, but Fran Brody, writing in 1945, she could see that there was some sort of lack of anyone talking about the first vision in the earliest Mormon uh, writings. I mean, the official church writings, everything, uh, or people's journals. No one seemed to be talking about a first vision in 1820. <clears throat> and so she puts in her book that there's some sort of something to resolve on this, so that it needs more research. Well, that had started my mom thinking about it. Well, she got her older sister and my grandma involved on this. And so when uh, Gerald and I moved, got married and uh, Gerald moved down to California, I uh, got a machinist job down there. So I'm still down around my mom and my aunt. Um, we'd get together and we'd talk about <laughs> different uh, research on the first vision, which led to me having a discussion with my bishop who's trying to save the day and get me back active in the church. And because uh, at that point I was still on the rolls and um, had just recently uh, got married to an apostate. So I, I was infamous in the ward. My best girlfriend in the ward was another girl called Sandra. And so we were the two Sandras. And uh, here's the one Sandra that married in the Los Angeles temple and is living this very godly life. And here's the example of what not to do. Here's the other Sandra <laughs> uh, that married an apostate and is on her way out of the church. So, you know, what can I say? So, and evidently that's the way it played out. She uh, stayed Mormon as far as I know. Anyways, uh, so the question of first vision comes up. My bishop's trying to save the day. He wants to meet with me to give me all the big answers. That didn't go well. And, uh, but he finally agrees that he will send a letter to Joseph Fielding Smith, who was a, an apostle at that point and church historian. Uh, and whatever question I felt was the most important, he would send that up to the church historian. So I get together with mom and Gerald and Lucille and we're all trying to figure out, okay, what's the big, what's the one question we wanna ask? Well, one of the things my mom and my aunt had found out was there were these um, magazines that had been put into books called The Historical Record that were done by Andrew Jensen, uh, assistant Mormon church historian in the 1880s time frame. And my mom had a set of the historical record, and I don't know how she first got her set, but it had a, in one of the issues, wasn't one on the first vision. And when he tells the first vision story, 
this guy, uh, Andrew Jensen, when he tells the first vision story, Joseph Smith goes out in the woods to pray and he sees the Christ. No, oh, the, he's angel. the angel. I get it backwards. He, the, he's, he recounts that Joseph went in the woods and an angel appears to talk to him. Okay, so my aunt decides she wants one of those. So she goes to some used bookstore, buys the historical record. She gets home, looks at hers. Hers says, and he, the Christ, said unto me. And so here they both have the same book, but they read differently on the first vision. One going from angels and then over to Christ. And that one was supposed to be a reprint of the others, not just a re, re yeah, typeset. Yes. yes. Everyone, is, it has a different binding. You know it's the changed one. You know it's a later edition because of the bindings on them. And it's just, everyone assumes it's just a straight out reprint. Well, it's not. They've changed the words. And they may have changed a lot of other things. I never tried to figure that out. But uh, because of this change, this piques my whole problem with, okay, what is the story of the first vision? So we decide I'm going to write to Joseph Fielding Smith and ask him about first vision issues. Now, this is in 1960, June or summer. I don't remember. I don't remember. Or is you sure it wasn't 59? Uh, well, it could have it would, no, it could, I don't think it had been in 59. Anyway, so either the latter part of 59, first part of, of uh, 60. Uh, 60, somewhere in there. I'd have to look at the dates. But um, so my letter is, why did Jensen's history get changed from angel to Christ? Because we were beginning to suspect that when the Mormons early on told about the first vision, they spoke of it as being angels, not as God and Jesus. So when did the shift come in? When did the church start emphasizing that the first vision was seeing the Father and Son? And we were scouring all the books to find references to the first vision, journal of discourses, all that kind of stuff. And uh, the majority of them would say it was angels, not Christ or God. So I'm asking Joseph Fielding Smith, what's the deal? We got all these contradictions, what's going on? Why has this book changed? When did the emphasis come in on changing it to Christ and God? And by the way, I assumed that Joseph would have written his own account of the first vision at some early point, and the church must have it. So I want a copy of Joseph Smith's first handwritten account of the first vision. Now what's curious about this is there actually was an early account of the first vision that the church was hiding, but no one knew this. And so when I ask about this, I'm telling Joseph Fielding Smith thinks I know more than I do. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, but I just assumed, you know, he would have written it down. Um, I didn't know at that time that Joseph hardly ever wrote anything down. Almost everything was done by a scribe. So it would have just as easily have been a scribe as to be in his own hand as far as that way went. But so what's the earliest account? Well, uh, <laughs> I get a, the, the letter comes back to the bishop. I have to go into his office to talk to him because uh, the bishop's got to be in control. So uh, he's going to show me the letter from Joseph Fielding Smith and he um, castigates me a little for uh, being a doubting Thomas. And, More than a little. <laughs> yes, well, we're trying to be kind here. And so then he says that, uh, well, it wouldn't do any good if I showed you one. You wouldn't be, he was sure that I wouldn't be convinced. Well, yeah, because he knows what one I'd want to see, and he knows it wouldn't convince me. <laughs> it, it wouldn't solve problems. It would just create more. Well, I don't know that. But uh, anyways, that led to a big thing on the first vision, uh, which is in the book, and started a domino effect of us harassing the church historian's office and uh, the church historian's office trying to figure out how to tell everybody the tanners were full of it. 
and we don't know zip, and so ignore them, you know, but uh, that's in the book too. <laughs> Ron, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I want to read the, the opening line of Joseph Fielding Smith. Now, Sandra is 19 yeah. and pregnant. This 19-year-old yeah. woman who's pregnant. And Joseph Fielding Smith starts out like, this young woman asks for a photostatic copy. Well, if we furnished it, would that convince her? And he just goes on and he accuses her of being part of a conspiracy and whatnot. And the thing was is that Joseph Fielding Smith knew that he had that, that thing, that first vision account. And when Von Brody tried to get it in the 50s, Joseph Fielding, she had asked in a similar way, I'd like to see the 1932 diary. Well, it wasn't in the diary, but Joseph Fielding Smith knew it was in the safe, and Fawn Brody, he, he said, there's some things we don't show anybody. And so Fawn Brody, a actually, she was what, the niece of David O. McKay? Yeah. And David O. McKay got really angry that she asked for it, and, and uh, finally David O. McKay agreed that she could see it, but she said, you know, no, I don't want to have anything to do with this, and she never did any research in the LDS archives again. And uh, so here's Joseph Fielding Smith. Like one, one Mormon uh, said when they read the book that, it that Joseph Fielding Smith was the villain of the piece. And in one sense, this is, this is really true because it, this was driving the Tanners because if they had just given an honest answer, but it was always these accusations and always this obfuscation and lying. And in those days, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the apostles writing to your family uh, if you were having problems. But, you know, she, her mother was concerned about her leaving the church and was writing to um, uh, Lee Grand Richards and different people. Different apostles. Different apostles. Church and so, historians. And, and so they were writing because this was the great granddaughter of Brigham Young, and the church was smaller in the, those days. And so everybody gets involved, and you have this barrage of letters that, that were kept uh, around all of these, uh, these controversies. And it, it, you know, so my, one of the things I feel is that if the, if, if the church had not responded from the beginning in this way to Sandra and Gerald, they wouldn't have had them uh, uh, so motivated over the years to try and get at the truth because they would bring something out, the church would deny it with some lame argument and then uh, slander the tanners and deny that they even existed and then that would, you know, and then it would blow up in their face because it, the documents really were there and then uh, new questions arose and so it went. And so they started out early with their troublemaking. Well, let's, let's talk about Lighthouse, the book, because whenever you go to write a book, you usually always have a, an outline of what you want to cover. What were some of the things you wanted to make sure were in the book? Well, this is one thing, and uh, <clears throat> one of the things was is that the book, I was asked to write the book by Signature, which is Liberal Mormon Press, and so it's written to... Mormons, and it deals with questions that they're dealing with now, particularly because of uh, the, the gospel topics, essays, and different things that they've had to admit uh, that Joseph Smith is using a seer stone. Now they'll show you a seer stone. For a long time, they denied that he used it. And uh, so it's really written toward that audience, uh, not towards a Christian audience. And uh, um, one time Eric said, well, that's too bad. It wasn't published uh, by a cri uh, Christian publisher, but my purpose was to write it so that Mormons could read it, they could relate to it. But one of the things I really wanted to do and worried about really all the way through was that I would be, would be bringing out the gospel element, that it wasn't simply that the Tanners had these problems and left the church, but that, that their search for truth and their finding truth in Jesus's gospel was something I wanted to come through to, from a perspective that a Mormon could, could grasp it and could accept that. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Well, talking to you while you were writing the book, you had some real struggles with the publisher on that. 
that it seemed like a lot of the Christian aspects were tending to get on the editor's floor, you might say. Yeah. What were some of the struggles that you had there? Well, what I mean, what they did, and I wondered, uh, in fact, one time I, I wrote to the publisher and said, oh, you know, I have a contract to you, with you, and you have completely uh, distorted the story I told. And um, if I, and I'm not going to break my contract, but I'll tell you, once the book is out, I'm going to say, they used me, this was not my story. Well, they, they got defensive. What had actually happened was funny because it wasn't them at all. They had farmed this out to some Christian or some other non-Mormon, uh, the manuscript out, who cut it in half and actually changed things. So like, for example, I'd say, you know, Gerald didn't restrict his reading to Christian books. He read all kinds of uh, books, historical books, liberal books, Mormon books, and they twisted that around to where that said, Gerald never read anything but people who agreed with him. You know, I mean, these, these kind of changes. And, um, and so I was very happy that when I found out that, that the signature was as surprised as I was, and uh, I don't know if they were as horrified as I was because, you know, they're, uh, but so from that time on, yes, we have shorter uh, book, I uh, had to rewrite several sections to try and get everything in, but from then on they didn't cut anything, you know. But it still was a lot shorter, yeah. And in defense of the publisher, how many pages was your manuscript? Oh, uh, <laughs> it was 700 and some pages, yeah, yeah I mean. <laughs> but it was, they didn't want to print that big a book. <laughs> but there were some great stories. Yep. That's the problem, yeah. you know, you've got, you've got the Tanners and this 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 sixty year battle with the LDS Church yeah. on every subject, <laughs> and you're gonna and not only that, but you also have to get what the other side was saying, yeah. and make a credible case that uh, that the Tanners were still uh, right on in their research, and so yeah, I, I think that probably it you know. A little shorter version was fine. I just didn't want it distorted, you know. Yeah. And that's what the first uh, editor did. Apparently, they were just hired. I don't, you know. I I ask him, you know, you should never do that again with with a Christian writer. Yeah, the sixty years of um, notorious uh, back and forth with the Mormon Church in the press and lawsuits and everything else. And the CIA. CIA gets into this. Yes, that's an interesting chapter on. Uh, uh, yes, Mormon CIA guys that we got involved with. That, uh, that that's a crazy story. It's in there, but but to try to cover all of that, in you know that size of a book, <laughs> is a real uh, challenge to how you uh, select which parts of this 60-year history. Uh, have to be in the book when you have to make it shorter what does remain well, let me ask you about that because yes. there are a lot of excellent stories in there yeah. uh, I don't think a lot of people know the background story which is great how you put a lot of that in there Ron but um, of all the stories that are in there <laughs> what are the one or two because of time that you're really happy to see in print me? Yeah. Well, well, I both of you, really. Well, let's start yeah. with Sandra. Okay. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, I think the problems around the first vision when we first started out is uh, had to be in the book because that sets the research and the drive that carries you through the coming years of all of that. Um, so beyond that one, um, and that's got more to it. Well, I mean, we went up and talked to Apostle LeGrand Richards, and that's in the book, and that's another crazy story. Uh, but as part of this whole First Vision uh, research we were doing, um, 
the doctor clandestine was an important one in our journey and that's where in the 70s the mormon church was getting letters all the time from mormons asking about what these tanners are writing i mean we're just a little mom and pop outfit you know in that old house on west temple and were hardly impressive. I mean, <coughs> Mormons would stop in and they'd say, you know, is this all there is? They're in, they're in my dining room and I got some books over here, you know. So you guys think you're going to uh, have any impact on the Mormon church, you know? Uh, anyone could just set up a little print shop in their backyard and, and do this kind of stuff. But, but it was having an effect. It was having too much of an effect. Amen. Yeah. And so... The um, church historian asked Michael Quinn, a Mormon historian, uh, if a young coming on, just coming out of college degrees and stuff, that if he would write a rebuttal to our big Mormonism shadow reality book. And um, so Mike writes up this, what he thought was a good rejoinder to show uh, we don't know zip and uh, gives it to the Arrington, the historian, and he says, no, well, the church won't publish this because the brethren are worried this raises more questions than it would solve. And that's a problem for historians to answer our material because uh, they can concede, which they finally did, oh, yes, he used a rock, but everyone used a rock. And, you know, that's, that's no problem. Uh, magic? Everyone had magic, you know, so, uh, and uh, the book of Abraham doesn't check out. Oh, well, that doesn't matter because it was a, it was a revelation. And so th the answers that they were getting together were things that didn't really cover the problem. And so the historian reading Quinn's response sees Mm, uh, they, the brother not going to like this. What the answer they want is the tanners are totally off mark. Everything they said was wrong, and uh, so you know we've solved that. Well, the historians knew they couldn't give a simple answer. It takes a lot of words to do spin on something as simple as the Book of Abraham papyri don't translate to the Book of Abraham. You know, so. Uh, what do you do with the Joseph Smith's inability to translate the book when supposedly the prophets here in Revelator has the gift of translating? And he looks at Egyptian papyri and uh, sees the book of Abraham. A scholar looks at the book of Ab uh, the papyri and sees Egyptian funerary text. Anyway, so they asked Mike to write a rebuttal to us. The church won't publish it. And so uh, Quinn had put so much effort into doing this response that he decides to print it up himself then. But he's afraid to put his name on it because the historian had told him he didn't, th the church wouldn't print it. So he doesn't want to get in trouble with the historian's office. He doesn't want to get in trouble with the brethren who don't want to print it. So he decides to do it anonymously. And he has scrapes together all his money and has this pamphlet, little pamphlet, white pamphlet, printed up and sends out free copies to institute seminary teachers all over the United States. And um, well, so we get one, not through the mail. I mean, you know, through the grapevine, people told us, oh, did you see this uh, anonymous historian's written this rebuttal to you? So Gerald's reading it through and he's trying to figure out, okay, which one of these guys uptown wrote this? And um, by doing research on the style of the person writing, he, he realized this guy uh, was in love with Latin phrases. And the one that stands out is post hoc ergo proctor hoc. <laughs> and I'm sure you all understand what that meant. So, because it doesn't matter. The fact is, that Quinn uses this in his thesis that he'd already written uh, a couple of years before. And Joseph, uh, Gerald sees the same Latin phrase in this little pamphlet. I mean, who in the world? <laughs> you know, you're writing a response to the Tanners. I mean, really, you're going to give us Latin? You know what I mean? Uh, I've talked to educated people that 
say like, what? You know? <laughs> I mean, not everybody knows this phrase. So who would put it in a little pamphlet to respond to the Tanners? So Gerald was uh, on the track on that one. And then he talked to a uh, Mormon Institute uh, of Religion, Mormon guy at the University of Utah, a guy named Reed Durham. And Reed to told Gerald, before the pamphlet was printed, Reed had told Gerald, I have heard that the church is planning a rebuttal to your book. And Mike Quinn might be the guy that's going to do it. And Gerald made some little notes about this and just tucked it away because he didn't uh, know for sure whether it ever come to fruition. So when the pamphlet came out, Gerald's remembering, wait a minute, I had that call from that Mormon historian months ago. And uh, so he digs through his box. Gerald did not file. He dug <laughs> through a box of newspaper clippings and magazines and everything else. And he finds this little note he had made. Yes, the note is, is in there. And, and it's... <laughs> Uh, and Mike Quinn's name is on this little note. <laughs> so uh, he's, oh, okay, that convinces him it's got to be Mike Quinn. So he calls up Mike Quinn, and uh, who is the church's darling coming on the scene as the big church apologist. Uh, and so he just calls him up, and he says, uh, do you know who wrote the... Uh, Little, uh, what is it? How does that title go? Uh, uh, response to Shadow Reality. Uh, Mormonism Shadow Reality. I forget the actual title of this little It's pamphlet. called uh, Gerald and Sandra Tanner's uh, Distorted View of Mormonism a, a Response to Mormonism Shadow uh, or Reality by a Latter day Saint historian. Yes. So, no name. So, it's, so Gerald wants to know, did you write it? And <laughs> Quinn, uh, who is this? <laughs> uh, it's Gerald Tanner. Oh, well, no, 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 it wasn't me. No, no. And the funny thing is that uh, Quinn has since died uh, about three years ago now. His memoirs were turned over to Signature Books by his family. And so we now have Quinn's diaries from that period where Quinn tells about Gerald calling him. Oh. <laughs> and, and he says, I felt so bad uh, that I had to lie to Gerald about this, but he's um, uh, got to protect the historian's office from the brethren and uh, all the way around, he's afraid he'd get in trouble and all. So. Uh, we know, so now we have, we have three, uh, all three people involved in these calls all on record on their points of view on what happened. Because so Mike Quinn in his memoirs gives his point of view. But the other guy, the historian, Arrington, that asked Mike to do it in the first place, he's died and his diaries have come out and signature books printed uh, his notes. And so you look in Arrington's notes and Arrington says, well, yeah, I got this call from Gerald Tanner <laughs> wanting to know <laughs> who authored this and if the churches uh, put it out and uh, all those kind of things. And Arrington writes, and I felt so bad that I had to lie to Gerald about this. <laughs> <laughs> and the irony of this, that supposedly they're the guys telling the truth and we're supposedly the guys that are lying. <laughs> And when Gerald calls up to confront him on who did the pamphlet, they're the ones that are going to lie because they got to do it because of situations of uh, getting them in trouble with the brethren. Uh, so they can't admit to doing it because they knew the brethren would be mad that, that they did this. Because it's exactly what the brethren were worried about. It raises more questions than it solves. So it's all in the book. Uh, but it's real crazy now we got all of the, you were able to get access to a little bit of that before you did your Yeah, work. I didn't have, uh, what happened was when I was talking to Mike Quinn, he was still saying, I neither confirm or deny yeah. to me. <laughs> and um, Pe uh, Peggy Fletcher Stack had reported in the newspaper that he confirmed it. And so I, I 
wrote to her and said, now are you sure about this, that he actually did admit this? And she said, well, I never report anything that isn't true. So I thought, okay, we can't trust that source. <laughs> However, uh, Gary Bergera, who was the editor, he was the guy who asked me to do this book of signature books at the time, he had gotten a hold apparently of part of the diary and of, had, Quinn. of Quinn and put it in a footnote of his Arrington diary, uh, which wasn't out yet, but he gave me the, the quotes and things where Quinn actually admitted. But it's funny seeing, you know, uh, seeing it was a dark day for Leonard Arrington. I think he says, it's a dark day for me. Because <laughs> he knew that it was blowing up in his face because they were hoping. I mean, Quinn would do things like he, he, he'd give it his own date for the first vision. And of course, the brethren are going to love that, right? And all this stuff, he states in there that, well, you know, our apostles are, are, are as, as likely to fall into error as any other man or something. That's in the track. Well, and then all of a sudden, within two or three weeks, Gerald Tanner is reporting <laughs> who wrote this thing. And so it went off like a bomb, you know, and a very sad day for, but Leonard Arrington was very soon after that, his, his title was revoked. He was told not to say that his title was revoked, but to use this new title in his correspondence. Yeah, when he was church historian, that's uh, like, um a position that was voted on at General Conference. So to be church historian is a very high up position. And he ran the historians, Arrington ran the historians department. But Arrington had been getting in trouble, or, or the brethren were starting to worry about Arrington because they could tell he was writing too factual a history. And uh, they're getting more pushback about their history not being told right. Of course, we were helping all we could. And uh, so the, uh, Arrington is worried about, um, he doesn't want the pamphlet out because he's afraid that's going to really blow things up. Well, when the pamphlet does come out and the whole thing comes out, then it does blow everything up. But Arrington was already on a trajectory of getting in trouble with the brethren because he just in general was wanting to write more factual history and not have so much faith promoting spin on it. So our pamphlet and the rebuttal were one of the final straws of getting Arrington demoted to be sent down to BYU to be head of a history department down there, uh, which was a major step down as, as far as in the community of job titles Church historian to BYU professor, it, it was not an advancement. Yeah. It was a step down. And um, so the, in that period where Arrington was church historian is often referred to as the Camelot years, um, when historians were cranking out all kind of research. It was really a, an exciting time in Mormon studies. But the church put the kibosh on that one, you know, it's, it's, uh, we gotta stop this. But they can't stop the flood. Once you get the break in the dam, uh, you know, it's just gonna keep getting bigger. And so um, that's why they finally had to do the gospel topics essays because there was so much pushback from the members. Why wasn't I told Joseph married married women? Why wasn't I told Joseph married 14 year old girls? Uh, why didn't I know that you'd change the Doctrine and Covenants or the Book of Mormon? Or why didn't I know that this first vision was told different ways? And so everyone's giving pushback to the church. So they think they have to finally have an answer. So that's why you have gospel topics uh, that still on the website, although sometimes people have a hard time finding it because it's a couple of clicks down into the site to get to it. Um, so we were a part of forcing the church to deal forthrightly with their history. And uh, like Ron has said, the end goal was uh, that these people would continue their search for truth and come to see that Christ could fulfill those things that they were looking for in an organization. And uh, so. Let me very quickly, for time's sake, Ron, what was 
if it's not what we've talked about so far, what other story had to be told in the book that you felt really had to be brought out? Well, I mean, I'll just briefly say two. One was the the family story in terms of Gerald's other ministries at the rescue mission and just the kind of person Gerald was. I mean, um, he was a very remarkable Christian and uh, also could be very annoying in, in just being so sure. But uh, so in terms of the sureness, one of the important stories was the Mark Hoffman forgeries. Mm. Mark Hoffman was a very good forger made probably the best in the 20th century. He did all sorts of forgery, monies, coins, uh, uh, handwriting. Uh, one person who I interviewed said he was sitting in a restaurant with uh, him one time and he was doing like George Washington's signature, you know. And so he's very good and, and who knows how many uh, Hoffman forgeries there are out there still. But uh, Gerald was, Gerald and Sant, well, Gerald particularly yeah. was the first one to come out publicly. These, there's a problem here. And they came out, I think, about a year before the church admitted that the, the, the church officially accepted the letters. Gerald had already, like a year later, uh, earlier, called it into question. Gerald, they'd bring in these handwriting experts on several different occasions. Gerald would look at it, he's wrong. But he's a handwriting expert. It doesn't matter. It's impossible. <laughs> and so Sanders, one, the one letter that was really interesting was newsletter, is where Sandra had one side on the Hoffman forgeries. Yeah, well, but you're Two not an expert, <laughs> right? And Gerald said, these are the reasons I doubt it. Sandra said, but, you know, these are the reasons to accept it, maybe. And, uh, and that was an interesting time, too. Yes. Right, and one of the problems in our marriage was on these kind of things, Gerald almost always was right. <laughs> <laughs> and, <coughs> so when he's telling me Mark Hoffman documents are forgeries, I said, Gerald, not only have the church's best historians all conceded that these are authentic, uh, they submitted the one, was it the FBI? or? I don't remember. Uh, oh, yeah, they, uh, the FBI looked at one of the things. Yeah. And so, I mean, experts had been looking at these things. Oh, Gerald's not trained in anything. <laughs> and uh, he says, I'm telling you, they're frauds. <laughs> you know, Gerald. And so my plea to Gerald was, I was afraid we were going to get sued over this slander, you know, calling some guy a forger. And uh, I said, just don't lose my house. Get on. <laughs> well, Mark Hoffman came over after they put out. So Gerald writes this little pamphlet out and sends Sandra up to hand it out at uh, the su Sunstone. Yeah. And, you know, a couple days later, here comes Mike Ho Mark Hoffman. You're going to ruin all these deals I've got planning. I just, you know, with this family, this old Mormon family is just going to give me these documents. But when they see this doubt, they're going to be so... They're, they're going to lose trust. What are you doing of all people, you know? And so Sandra's in the shop at the time, but Gerald isn't. So yeah. Gerald comes home later, and what did he say? So I says, Gerald, you missed Mark. He came in, and uh, he told me about all this research he was doing, and he's been talking to the... Um, Bullock, was it Bullock? Yeah, Thomas Bullock family, and Thomas Bullock was the secretary to Brigham Young. And he says, Thomas Bullock had all these financial records of, Joseph, of Brigham Young's. And it shows how Brigham Young was misusing church funds and appropriating money out of the church coffers for his own use and uh, all this stuff. And I'm about to get these from the Bullock family. But if you keep making noise about uh, questioning my documents, these guys won't want to do business with me. So he gave me this big thing about uh, why we should back off when he's about to make this fine. Now, I'm a descendant of Brigham Young, and so Hoffman's playing to my family interest and our interest in showing that the Mormon church had a bigger financial investment in uh, uh, making money than just churches usually do. And so the whole financial thing was of an interest to us. 
So Gerald comes home. I said, you miss Mark. And he told me all oh, about the bullet papers. And, well, and I'm giving him the whole sales pitch that Mark gave me. <laughs> and, and I get through and he says, and I have a bridge in Brooklyn I want to sell you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks. <laughs> so, hence the split editorial, because I said, Gerald, the whole world is against you on this decision, you know. <laughs> and he said, I don't care. It's, there's something wrong. And I think that speaks to certainly Gerald's character and his yes. integrity, because the things that Hoffman was putting out, those of us who are critical of the Mormon Church could have really use that kind of information. But I think it goes back to what you said earlier, Ron, about making sure that your research is accurate. Because we all know that if you make any slight mistake, Latter-day Saints often will capitalize on that and want to turn you off completely. And so it's, it's very important to make sure that we are as accurate as possible. Certainly we're human, we can all make mistakes, but uh, we're certainly not doing cover-ups like another organization that we know. But I want to ask you, Sandra, you officially retired last year. So very quickly, what are you doing now? Because Working? It sound, it's a, yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't sound like retirement in the traditional sense. Uh, well, I have a little office in an office building where my three employees that I've had for years um, sit and do data entry because we're digitizing our research and to put it all on our website and then we're going to redo the website if I live that long and um, I'm still giving talks and I just did a, another interview with uh, John DeLynn on um, Mormon Stories podcast uh, so I mean I get around on different things that way so it's I get to, to uh, choose when I do something, which is after 9 o'clock. And <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm still engaged in re reading, uh, watching YouTube things, trying to keep up on what's going on in the Mormon world, monitoring what they're all doing. <laughs> Ron, any final words? No, I think that... That's good. I don't know if Sandra could stop monitoring, but I, I'd yeah. be curious. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought I would. I thought, oh, God's released me from Mormonism. And I even contemplated moving back to California by my brother. And then I thought, but this is, this is really uh, my home, my people, uh, my nerd group in Salt Lake and uh, I go to California and no one's going to understand anything about my life. You know? <laughs> You're like, what? When my oldest daughter went to Christian college, uh, so this would be back in the 1979-80 time period, I think. Uh, she calls me up and she says, Mom, I'm having trouble here talking to the girls. Everyone talking about what kind of home life they had and about their parents and all. And I tell them things that happened at our house and they all think I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> because they come home from school, they didn't know if it was going to be a polygamist, the FBI, or, you know, some attorney to sue us or what, you know, I mean, it was just, there was always something going on. So if mom's busy at dinner time, everyone's having cereal, you know, I mean, they just knew to go about their business. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank you for coming to be able to talk to us today and show a side that maybe a lot of people don't know, but there is a, a lot of good information in the book Lighthouse and, and a lot of fascinating stories. Uh, it, what fascinated me was a lot of your family members actually coming to Christ through yeah. this whole thing. And uh, yeah. it's just amazing. But I don't think there's any of us probably sitting here that can say that we have not benefited from the Tanner's research. Would you agree on that? Yes. I, I know I have personally, yes. Yeah. So, so thank you for coming. And uh, sh do we have time? Do you want to do that? Oh, oh, well, yeah. Are there any questions? I didn't know we were going to do that. Yes, in the back, Eddie. I just kind of want Sandra to touch on on the uh, Mark Hoffman thing. So once Gerald 
stuck to his guns and stand up the truth. And you know the salamander letter. And yeah. He was afraid to lose the house. Yeah. But Gerald's always stuck to the truth. Tell us, explain to us in your words how that everything kind of shifted from that point. Because you didn't just side with Mark Hoffman because he was out to get the Mormon Church, mm -hmm. give him a black eye. You guys stood for truth, and how it gave you kind of credibility with people yeah. in the church because they were always a lot of them told you're the devil and you got to uh, die in. Right. That, you know, the credibility that came from that. You know? Well, after Mark got. Uh, killed two people and got arrested and uh, the whole story came out. Then there were books written about the Mark Hoffman and there were several national uh, books on Hoffman and the whole case and were mentioned in all of them because Gerald's the one lone wolf crying in the wilderness that, you know, hey, it's fraud, it's fraud. <laughs> but uh, that changed in the Salt Lake area, Utah area, it changed people's perception of us because it, just, it flipped things. Suddenly, a lot of Mormons that had assumed we were these evil monsters that lied all the time realized, well, wait a minute, the prophets here and Revelator got it wrong and Gerald Tanner got it right? <laughs> I mean, there had been a picture in the newspaper at the time of them finding the... Uh, what is it, the anthem transcript that has the picture of Mark and the whole Mormon Church First Presidency uh, all looking at Mark's document, and I think it's Kimball, is there looking at it with a magnifying glass. And, and he didn't get a revelation that the guy's a crook. <laughs> you know, so how, how could Gerald Tanner in that old house in the rundown district of Salt Lake get it right and the prophet here in Revelator uh, is looking at it and he thinks it's genuine. Could I add one thing oh. there? Yeah. It's so like Mark Hoffman makes up these fake uh, document with fake uh, <coughs> symbols on it, uh, the Anton manuscript. Yeah. And so what comes from BYU is uh, Hugh Nibley was their big apologist in those days. And he declared within a week that it was translatable. <laughs> and that it was, you know, and so, and he told you which direction it read from this way to that way. But it didn't, it was just all fake, you know. <laughs> and so this was one of the problems that you had. One of the things was interesting is that in Hoffman's testimony, when they were asking him about the Salaman letter, salamander letter, he basically said at one point, as I recall, yeah, it happened pretty much the way Gerald said. <laughs> I did it pretty much the way Gerald said. So... Someone else. Were you ever in, in fear of your lives when you were dealing with, you know, what, what you were We doing? always had a fire extinguisher in the kitchen. Uh, when we first started out, we lived in a wood frame house up in the avenues uh, in the, you know, what would it have been? Uh, 60 to 64 time frame and we had just started doing our little publishing out of our back room and we decided <laughs> uh, to do an expose of the Mormon temple ritual and print the whole thing up uh, so but again I was worried about where I'm living you know I said Gerald are you sure we want to put this out you know and <laughs> so yeah, there, there were times when uh, we were worried. I mean, there was the, you know, you do remember the Nauvoo Expositor fiasco that uh, Joseph Smith burned and destroyed the printing press that came out in opposition to him in Nauvoo that eventually led to his death. Uh, so it's not like the Mormons don't have a history of this sort of thing, you know, so mm -hmm. I can... And not that I thought that the Mormon church itself would do it. I thought there would be some fanatic Mormon that might do it, which is really funny when you get into Quinn, Mike Quinn, the historian, in his memoirs, he talks about getting death threats from anti-Mormons. Mm -hmm. And oh, it's a big fear, you know, oh, just if we're getting all these threats from the anti-Mormons. And I'm like, yeah, come over to my side. Well, you, want to, you want to swap comparisons here about <laughs> death threats? You know, but um, uh, fortunately, there weren't any crackpots on either side that, uh, Took it, well, I guess you could say Mark was, but uh, 
other than Mark <laughs> and the Lafferty's and all the other crackpots, but uh, <laughs> but generally the Mormon people themselves uh, have evidently decided that uh, since we're all right here in Salt Lake Valley, that they'll leave it to the Mormon church to handle this stuff uh, and not them individually feeling threatened that they needed to go take care of it themselves. Had we lived somewhere else, I could see where a Mormon might have felt more of a personal need to take care of it for fear that the brethren didn't know what was going on. But because we're right here where the brethren know what we're doing, I think a lot of them Mormons just figured, well, the brethren will take care of it. Whatever needs done, they'll take care of it. Can you tell the story of the Hoffman limousine? Oh. <laughs> During the Hoffman... For the, for, yeah, the Hoffman limousine was the question. Yeah. Uh, during the Hoffman murder trial and all of that, uh, one of the major networks had, and I think well, it must have been, what was KSL at that time? I don't remember if they were still the same affiliate as they are now. But anyways, whoever they were at that time, um, the affiliate in New York decided on the morning show or whatever that they wanted to interview uh, me and Gerald. And so... But because we were the only ones out there vocally saying he made the documents up and the whole trial hasn't completed or whatever. So they say, okay, we're going to have a limousine come pick you up at four in the morning and drive you over to KSL Studios to do this interview for the morning show. Ah, uh, okay. So... Uh, we... Uh, Oh, gee. We go to bed, and uh, we and this car comes quietly into the driveway and turns its headlights off. And Gerald is uh, woke up on this, and he's watching out the upstairs window and seeing somebody walking up to the porch. And he thinks it's somebody coming to, you know, set the house on fire or something. Uh, but the network had already canceled the show because things had taken another direction and so they had canceled that but they forgot to cancel the limousine to pick us up and so here's this sneaky thing where they turn the lights off they don't like they don't want to wake anyone up you know and just sneaking up to the porch yeah it scared us to death we and then it's just the chauffeur <laughs> a little bit about how you and Gerald went from questioning the Mormon church to actually faith in Jesus? Uh, well, there's a book. Uh, <laughs> I just wondered about that. Yeah, Gerald, before I met Gerald, he had had questions raised to him about Mormon truth claims. And uh, he went back to Independence, Missouri as a 19-year-old kid driving a jalopy. He goes back to Independence, Missouri to search out the different splinter groups that still believed the Book of Mormon but didn't believe the rest of the stuff. And uh, visits around to them. And then he visits this little Church of Christ that believed the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And uh, through their... I mean, they really loved the Lord. They just hadn't come through all of Mormonism yet. Then the little group later gave up the Book of Mormon. But at this point, they still were hanging on to it. And uh, through the, that little group, Gerald had come to faith in Christ. So when I meet him and I go to his meeting at his folks' place, uh, he's a Christian, but he's a Christian that's not all the way out of Mormonism yet. And so... Uh, then Gerald's trying to explain to me the, the difference between Mormonism and Christianity. And uh, I still hadn't figured it all out when we got married. I had not accepted the Lord at that point. And um, I did a few months later. But Gerald had sent me out to Independence to meet with these people because it had such a spiritual impact on his life that he thought, well, because he didn't know anybody in California, didn't know any Christians or anybody. 
And so I got to get Sandra back to spend some time with these Christians back there so she can get a feel for what it means to, to really worship God. And so I went on the train by myself, pregnant, <laughs> to uh, Missouri and uh, visit, spend a week out with these people, which really impressed me. They were just really sweet, humble Christian people that were, it, it just was very moving to be with them. <laughs> But when I came back, so I think that was in September, and when I came back October 24th, I think it was, on a Saturday, I was home alone, Gerald was at work, and I was listening to Christian radio, and uh, this uh, minister came on, and he's preaching from 1 John uh, chapter 4. Here in his love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us, and sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. And as the minister was preaching on that section, that's what convicted me that I was not the goddess and embryo. I wasn't on my way to eternal exaltation or whatever. Uh, I was a sinner in need of the saving grace of Christ. And uh, so that's when I accepted Christ. But we still both believe the Book of Mormon at this point. We're, we're still struggling with all this stuff. And uh, so then, it was in um, uh, summer of 62. We got married in 59, so now we're to the summer of 62. We both are studying and tr reading and trying to determine, does the Book of Mormon stand up to examination? It, will it make it as a historical text? And, um, and of course, you know, I, I'm sure most of you know, I mean, there's, there is no evidence in DNA to support the Book of Mormon. There is no uh, anthem transcript sample of writing of it in, at anywhere else other than what Joseph Smith invented that's authentic. And there's um, no language group, no people group, no place location. Everything was coming up negative on all this. And so then finally, Gerald and I each had personally come to the conclusion that we couldn't accept the Book of Mormon anymore, but we hadn't talked about it. Uh, as we both were searching deeper into our doubts on this, we quit comparing notes and talking, I think because we each were not sure where the other one was at. And so we just didn't talk about it as much. And then Gerald came home from work one night. He was working the afternoon, evening shift. And he says, I got to talk to you about something that happened to work tonight. I go, mm, okay. So we sat down at the kitchen table and he said, uh, usually at dinner break, he would sit and read his scriptures. And um, would you imagine my machinist, you know, I mean, this is not typical machinist reading material. <laughs> but uh, anyways, the, the guys had come up to him that night and said, we noticed that you read both the Bible and Mormon scriptures, so, but you don't seem to be a regular Mormon. So just what is it, what do you believe anyways? Uh, <laughs> and Gerald says, uh, it was that moment of facing the truth, you know, do I really believe the Book of Mormon? And he told him, no, I'm not Mormon. I left the Mormon church. So what do you believe? And he said, uh, well, I did believe the Book of Mormon, but I've realized now that it's not really history and I can't accept it. So that's what he came home to tell me after work, was I want you to know that I told the guys at work, I don't believe the Book of Mormon anymore. And I said, well, praise God, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we thank you for all coming out for this. Um, I'm gonna pray. And after we pray, if you could allow Ron and Sandra to go out into the bookstore area, they are going to be signing some books. If you have any questions, you can ask them out there. But I think you can kind of make a path.